Welcome to College Briefing. The content of the briefing includes. Amid massive search for mass killing suspect, main residents remain behind locked doors. Abortion restrictions in Russia spark outrage as the country takes a conservative turn. Why Farhan Zaidi believes Bob Melvin is perfect fit for giants. Slain Maryland judge remembered as dedicated and even keeled. Union workers score big pay gains as labor action sweeps U.S. Amid massive search for mass killing suspect, main residents remain behind locked doors. The Toronto Star. A manhunt is underway after 18 people were killed and 13 others wounded in a mass shooting at a bowling alley and bar in Lewiston, Maine, on October 26. The search for Robert Card, an army reservist, focused on a property in Bowdoin belonging to one of his relatives, but authorities said it was unclear whether Card had ever been at the location. Card, 40, underwent a mental health evaluation in July after acting erratically while with his reserve regiment. He had been committed to a mental health facility for two weeks after expressing a desire to shoot up a military base. Maine has a long-standing culture of gun ownership and does not require permits to carry guns. However, lawmakers passed a yellow flag law in 2019 that would require police to seek a medical evaluation of anyone believed to be dangerous before trying to take their guns away. Critics claim the law is weaker than the red flag laws adopted by other states. Abortion restrictions in Russia spark outrage as the country takes a conservative turn. The Toronto Star. Despite abortion being legal and widely available in Russia, recent attempts to restrict it have angered many across the conservative country. Activists are urging supporters to make official complaints, circulating online petitions and even staging small protests. The health ministry has drawn up talking points for doctors to discourage women from terminating their pregnancies, and new regulations will soon make many emergency contraceptives virtually unavailable and drive up the cost of others. Senior lawmaker Pyotr Tolstoy said that by spring, lawmakers would strive to adopt a nationwide ban on abortion in private clinics, where about 20% took place in recent years, according to state statistics. Conservative lawmakers failed to enact such a ban before, but the health ministry now says it is ready to consider it. Last year's U.S. Supreme Court decision rescinding a five-decade-old right to abortion has reshaped American abortion policy, shifting power to states. About half of U.S. states have adopted bans or major restrictions, although not all are being enforced due to legal challenges. After the USSR's collapse, government and health experts promoted family planning and birth control, sending abortion rates falling. At the same time, laws allowed women to terminate a pregnancy up until 12 weeks without any conditions, and until 22 weeks for many social reasons, like divorce, unemployment, or income. That changed under Putin who has forged a powerful alliance with the Russian Orthodox Church, promoting traditional values and seeking to boost population growth. Health Minister Mikhail Murashko has condemned women for prioritizing education and career over childbearing. Over the decades, the number of abortions in Russia fell from 4.1 million in 1990 to 517,000 in 2021. Only in instances of rape is an abortion legally allowed between 12 and 22 weeks. Some regions hold days of silence when public clinics don't provide them. Women must wait 48 hours or even a week depending on what stage of pregnancy between their first appointment and the abortion, in case they reconsider. They also are offered psychological consultations designed to discourage abortions, according to state-issued guidelines reviewed by AP, health authorities have introduced an online motivational questionnaire outlining state support if women continue the pregnancy, according to a state clinic gynecologist who was not authorized to comment publicly and spoke on condition of anonymity. She said the waiting periods were psychologically hard for some of her patients. During that week, of waiting, she might start getting nauseous and experience other symptoms of pregnancy, she added. They don't understand the point. State clinics in one region referred women to a priest before getting an abortion. Authorities maintained the consultation was voluntary, but some women told the media they had to get a priest to sign off to get an abortion. The anti-abortion push comes as Russian women appear to be in no rush to have more children amid the war in Ukraine and economic uncertainty. Sales of abortion pills in 2022 were up 60 percent, according to Nikolai Bespolov, development director of the RNC Pharma Analytical Company. They fell 35 percent this year, still higher than pre-2022 levels. Sales of contraceptive medications also have been rising in 2022-23, he said. A recent health ministry decree restricted circulation of abortion pills used to terminate pregnancies in the first trimester. The decree puts mifepristone and misoprostol, used in the pills, on a registry of controlled substances requiring strict record-keeping and storage. For hospitals and clinics, where the pills are usually dispensed, 
the move will add more paperwork, but not much else, said Dr. Yekaterina Hivrich, head of gynecology at Lotta Clinic, a private clinic in St. Petersburg. But it will affect the availability of emergency contraceptives, sometimes known as morning after pills, which are taken within days of unprotected sex to prevent pregnancy. Three out of six brands available in Russia contain Mifepristone in a lower dose, meaning they'll be severely restricted once the decree takes effect September 1, 2024. They will require a special prescription, and not all pharmacies will stock them, said Irina Feynman, an activist in the northern region of Karelia, adding that getting a prescription takes time that women might not have when they need the pills. The health ministry did not respond to questions on whether it will exclude morning after pills in the decree. Officials earlier promised it won't affect those pills, but some pharmacies already list those with Mifepristone as available only under strict prescription conditions. After the restrictions were announced, Feynman said she and other activists stocked up on the pills to distribute in case of shortages. Sales of emergency contraceptives soared 71% through August 2023, over the same period last year, according to Bespolov. Those containing Mifepristone account for about half the market. New measures likely will increase the cost of unrestricted medications and possibly lead to short-term shortages. Senior lawmaker Pyotr Tolstoy said that by spring, lawmakers would strive to adopt a nationwide ban on abortion in private clinics, where about 20% took place in recent years, according to state statistics. Conservative lawmakers failed to enact such a ban before, but the health ministry now says it is ready to consider it. To Irina Volonets, an abortion opponent and children's rights ombudswoman in the Tatarstan region, it gives hope that this procedure will be taken out of private clinics eventually. She also wants increased state support for women with children as an incentive for boosting birth rates. Regional authorities have tried to get private clinics to stop offering abortions, with varying success. Kaliningrad is mulling a region-wide ban. In Tatarstan, about a third of all private clinics no longer provide them, officials said. In the Chelyabinsk region in the Urals, three clinics agreed to halt them. It's important to understand that the pressure on women will be growing even in the absence of a total ban, said Kaliningrad psychotherapist and activist Lena Zarin, who helped organize the recent bookstore meeting. An online petition against the ban in Kaliningrad has gathered nearly 27,000 signatures. In seven other regions, the health ministry is using another pilot project, having gynecologists try to get women to reconsider having an abortion. A document obtained by AP and cited by other media outlines language doctors are told to use, including saying pregnancy is a beautiful and natural condition for every woman, while an abortion is harmful to your health and a risk of developing complications. Natalia Moskvitina, founder of Women for Life, which aids women who decide against abortion, said she helped develop the instructions and is introducing similar scripts for doctors in several regions. Moskvitina made headlines in August after the region of Mordovia adopted a law she helped draft to ban encouraging abortions. At least one other region is considering a similar ban. Her program, which instructs doctors to congratulate women on being pregnant and gives baby-themed presents and information on support resources, has driven the abortion rate down 40% in Mordovia, she and local officials said. For women with doubts about abortion, such conversations might indeed help them reach a decision but for others, they could be deeply uncomfortable. Olga Mindalina was contemplating an abortion in 2020, traumatized by an earlier, difficult pregnancy. But when a doctor in a state clinic in the western city of Voronezh asked her what she wanted to do, she said she didn't know and was told, in this case, you should give birth. A clinic psychologist told her that women sometimes regret abortion, advising her to talk to her husband. A lawyer also told her about state benefits she could get if she gave birth. Mindalina decided to continue the pregnancy. Anastasia, a Muscovite who sought an abortion in 2020, said it wasn't very pleasant when a doctor urged her to change her mind. I simply don't want any children, she told AP, asking that her last name not be used for fear of reprisals. Dr. Lyubov Yerovaeva, a gynecologist who spearheaded family planning projects in the 1990s, believes the key is preventing unwanted pregnancies with education about birth control and making contraceptives widely available. Instead of talking a woman out of an abortion, authorities should do everything so she doesn't have to seek one, she said. Why Farhan Zaidi believes Bob Melvin is perfect fit for Giants. Yahoo! San Francisco Giants president of baseball operations Farhan Zaidi believes the team's new manager Bob Melvin is the perfect fit for the organization. Melvin, who previously played for the Giants in the 1980s, has deep ties to the Bay Area and calls managing the Giants a dream job. Zadie praised Melvin's experience and leadership characteristics, adding that his impressive resume makes him the ideal candidate to lead the team.
The Giants hope that Melvin can help guide the team back to the postseason after two consecutive years of missing out. Slain Maryland judge remembered as dedicated and even keeled. The Toronto Star. A U.S. judge known for being fair and even keeled was shot dead following an earlier ruling in a divorce case. Washington County Circuit Court Judge Andrew Wilkinson was shot outside his home by Pedro Argote, the man who had lost custody of his four children in the divorce case. Wilkinson was known for his calm demeanor and sense of humor, and had ruled in favor of Argote's wife in his absence. Union workers score big pay gains as labor action sweeps U.S. Financial Times Unionized workers in the U.S. have seen a resurgence in wage growth over the past year, with a number of high-profile strikes resulting in significant pay rises. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, year-on-year -year wage growth for union members reached 4.6% in the second quarter of 2023, catching up with the higher pay rises enjoyed by non-union workers since 2021. Union contracts ratified in the first half of this year saw particularly strong pay increases in the first year with average increases of 7% and 6.1%. The trend is part of a wider resurgence of labor action in the wake of the pandemic, with workers realizing the power they have in negotiations. Factors contributing to the trend include a tight labor market, which has strengthened workers' leverage, and the pandemic acting as a wake-up call to workers' powerlessness. Inflation has also motivated workers to seek strong wage increases to offset the rising cost of living. In India's strife-torn Manipur, narrative battle is fought on social media. Al Jazeera. The recent ethnic conflict between the Kukizo and Meitei communities in Manipur, India, has spilled over onto social media, with both sides using platforms like Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook to spread their narratives and shape public opinion. While the conflict on the ground has resulted in the loss of many lives, the battle on social media has been equally intense. The Kukizo and Meitei communities have each created numerous social media accounts to share their views and mobilize support. These accounts have been used to disseminate information, disinformation, hate, and claims of victimhood. They have also been used to troll opposing views and to group journalists into pro- and anti-camps. The conflict has seen a proliferation of narratives about the violence, with both sides accusing the other of various crimes and atrocities. The social media warriors have used the platforms to reinforce hostilities and to spread disinformation. For example, they have shared photos and videos that claim to show incidents of violence and abuse, but that have been proven to be from different locations and unrelated to the conflict. The social media battle has intensified as the conflict on the ground has continued. Both sides have used the platforms to call for support from both national and international organizations, and to accuse the other side of being un-Indian or unpatriotic. The battle on social media has had a significant impact on the conflict, shaping public opinion and influencing the actions of both sides. It has also had the potential to exacerbate tensions and prolong the conflict. As the conflict continues, the social media warriors continue to shape the narrative and fight for the hearts and minds of the rest of the world. Five-Year Passion Project turns former NSW mission into uplifting indigenous hub. ABC. A remote indigenous community in Australia has doubled the capacity of its preschool and added additional facilities, including banking and employment services. The Murren Bridge Preschool Community Hub will now be able to cater for 57 children, up from 25. The project involved consultation with the community, including children, who had input into the designs of the new facilities. Indigenous trainees were also involved in the construction process and received qualifications. The project has deepened the connection with the community for the academics involved at the University of Technology Sydney. Tooton, Virginia Tech rushed to 38-10 win over Syracuse. The Toronto Star. Virginia Tech defeated Syracuse 38-10 on Thursday, with Basil Tooton rushing for 118 yards and a touchdown. Malachi Thomas rushed for 87 yards, and Karen Drones added 65 yards rushing for the Hokies. Virginia Tech never trailed in the game and scored on their first six possessions. The Hokies had season highs in rushing yards, 318, and total yards, 528. Syracuse has now lost four straight games by an average of 29 points per game. The Orange struggled from the start, committing penalties and finishing the first half with just 62 yards. The Hokies will face number 18 Louisville in their next game, while Syracuse will host Boston College. Glasgow, LIU defense spark 24-23 comeback win over Central Connecticut. Associated Press. Long Island University's football team, the Sharks, staged a comeback to defeat Central Connecticut State University's Blue Devils 24-23 on Thursday night.
The Sharks trailed 23-10 at halftime but managed to rally back with a go-ahead touchdown pass from tight end Owen Glasgow and a strong defensive performance in the second half. The defense forced six straight punts and Central Connecticut turned the ball over on downs on their final possession. The victory improves Long Island's record to 2-6. Two Greyhounds euthanized, one injured during race featuring new safety device. ABC. Two Greyhounds were euthanized and another injured after a collision during a race at the Dapto Dog Racing Track in New South Wales. The incident occurred during a trial of a safety initiative called the Double Arm Lure, which aims to reduce injuries by preventing greyhounds from bunching together. Since the trial began, 30 dogs have been injured and two have been euthanized. The deaths mark the 36th greyhound racing fatality this year in NSW and the 97th nationwide. The Race Injury Review Panel will consider the incidents and make recommendations to prevent similar events in the future. Violent teen fight in Westover ends with injuries, arrest. Yahoo! At least one teenager has been hospitalized following a fight in Westover, West Virginia. Police have arrested Alyssa D. Bess, 18, who is accused of striking one of the 16-year-old victims with brass knuckles. The fight is being investigated and is believed to have started online as social media beefing. McTavish scores in OT as Ducks hand Bruins their first loss of the season with a 4-3 victory. Associated Press. The Anaheim Ducks defeated the Boston Bruins 4-3 in overtime in their NHL game on Thursday night. Mason McTavish scored the winning goal for the Ducks with 2.52 to go in the extra period. Boston had led 3-1 in the third period, but Anaheim forced overtime with 14.7 seconds left in regulation. Both teams had come into the game unbeaten this season. Elliot Cadeau named ACC Preseason Rookie of the Year. Yahoo! North Carolina Tar Heels guard Elliot Cadeau has been named the Preseason Rookie of the Year in the ACC, beating out competition from Duke and other universities. Cadeau, a five-star recruit, joined UNC earlier than expected after reclassifying into the 2023 cycle. He is expected to play a key role in the Tar Heels rotation this season. Federal Housing Minister scolds Vancouver over development fees. The Globe and Mail. Federal Housing Minister Sean Fraser has urged Vancouver-area civic politicians to consider other options for how to pay for new housing, saying the long-standing policy of having new developments pay for new infrastructure won't work in this crisis environment. In a strongly worded letter dated Monday to George Harvey, mayor of Delta who is the chair of the regional Metro Vancouver board, Mr. Fraser criticized the approach that growth should pay for growth that many cities in Canada have used as a philosophy when deciding whether to cover the costs for new infrastructure through increased property taxes for everyone or through increased development fees applied only to new housing. Li Keqiang, China's former premier, dies suddenly at 68. Financial Times. Li Keqiang, China's former premier, has died at the age of 68. Li, who was the head of Chinese President Xi Jinping's cabinet until March, suffered a heart attack in Shanghai. The sudden death of a senior leader will prove challenging for the Communist Party, which is grappling with an economic slowdown and geopolitical tensions with the West. Li had been seen as a moderate and a proponent of economic reform, and was viewed as a rival to Xi before the latter came to power. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Dr. Six, your resident observer from the Six Dimensions. Today, we have a diverse range of news stories from around the world. Let's dive in. In the United States, a manhunt is underway in Maine following a mass shooting that left 18 people dead. The suspect, an army reservist, remains at large, and authorities are focused on a property belonging to one of his relatives. This tragic event highlights the ongoing debate around gun ownership and mental health in the country. Meanwhile, Russia is facing outrage over recent attempts to restrict abortion. Activists are protesting against new regulations that will make emergency contraceptives virtually unavailable and drive up the cost of others. The conservative turn in the country has sparked a push for a nationwide ban on abortion in private clinics. These restrictions have ignited a fierce debate over women's reproductive rights in Russia. In sports news, the San Francisco Giants have a new manager, Bob Melvin, who is being hailed as the perfect fit for the organization. With deep ties to the Bay Area, Melvin is expected to lead the team back to the postseason after two years of missing out. Let's hope he can bring new energy to the team and lead them to victory. Tragedy struck in Maryland when a U.S. judge known for his fairness and even keeled demeanor was shot dead outside his home. The shooter was the man who had lost custody of his children in a divorce case ruled by the judge. This shocking incident reminds us of the dangers faced by those in the legal profession and the need for increased security measures. On a more positive note, union workers in the U.S. are experiencing a resurgence in wage growth. 
high-profile strikes have led to significant pay increases for union members, narrowing the wage gap with non-union workers. This trend reflects a growing realization of worker power and the need for fair compensation in the face of rising inflation. Moving to India, the recent ethnic conflict in Manipur has spilled over onto social media platforms. Both sides are using Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook to spread their narratives and shape public opinion. The battle on social media has been intense, with accusations, disinformation, and claims of victimhood flying from both sides. This highlights the power of social media in shaping conflicts and influencing public perception. In Australia, a remote indigenous community has transformed its preschool into a community hub, doubling its capacity and adding additional facilities. This project, which involved consultation with the community and the involvement of Indigenous trainees, aims to provide better services and support for children and families in the community. It's heartening to see collaborative efforts to improve education and opportunities for Indigenous communities. In the world of sports, we have exciting news from college football and hockey. The Long Island University Sharks staged a remarkable comeback to defeat Central Connecticut State University's Blue Devils. The Sharks trailed at halftime but rallied back in the second half with a strong defensive performance. In hockey, the Anaheim Ducks handed the Boston Bruins their first loss of the season in an overtime victory. It's always thrilling to see underdogs come out on top. Unfortunately, not all news is positive. Two greyhounds were euthanized and another injured during a race in New South Wales, Australia. This incident occurred during a trial of a safety device aimed at preventing injuries to greyhounds. The deaths highlight the ongoing concerns surrounding animal welfare in the racing industry. Lastly, we have news from the world of politics. Canada's federal housing minister has called on Vancouver-area civic politicians to consider alternative options for funding new housing. The traditional approach of having new developments pay for new infrastructure is being questioned in light of the current housing crisis. This debate reflects the challenges faced by cities in finding innovative solutions to address housing affordability. That's all for today's news roundup. It's been an eventful day with stories ranging from tragedy to triumph. As always, I encourage you to share your thoughts and join the discussion. What are your thoughts on these news stories? Do you have any questions or comments? Let's engage in a lively conversation. Thank you for tuning in. The content above showcases the latest briefing reports and analytical synopses, thoughtfully curated by the 6 Do team. These insights stem from a wide array of reputable media outlets, think tanks, government sources, and specialized experts worldwide. We encourage you to explore these sources for a comprehensive perspective. Keep in mind that while the content may not always align with the official standpoint of 6 Do Brief, it's not meant to be taken as absolute directives for decision-making. Comprising seasoned media professionals, learned scholars, and accomplished scientists, the 6 Do team embodies a trailblazing, fully independent media entity. To customize 6 Do Brief to meet your professional needs, you have the option to subscribe to a diverse array of briefings on our website. 6dobrief.com. Regardless of your location, you can conveniently receive 6 Do Brief via email.